Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Grand Rounds. I'm Jeff Miller, one of the co-directors of Grand Rounds. We're very pleased that you're joining us for this remote session. Um, I have just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, so first is um, the schedule for next week. Next week's Grand Rounds will be in person at the Hellman Auditorium at PI. We welcome you. We encourage you to join us in person if you're available. And if not, it will be simulcast via Zoom webinar. Next week's Grand Rounds is the ESSEC Award Lecture, delivered by a scholar in the field of mental health services whose work has an impact on mental health policymaking. And our speaker for that uh, award, or the recipient of that award, is Patricia Ariane, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. Uh, the title of the talk will be the use of human-centered design to improve uptake of psychosocial interventions, lessons learned from the UW Alacrity Center. Uh, and for those who attend in person, as always, there will be a lunch at 1220 outside the auditorium. So, and then before I introduce today's speaker, just a reminder about questions. We welcome questions from all attendees. Um, uh, we try to prioritize trainee questions. And so if you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question. Um, and then we also encourage people to ask questions themselves. The way to ask a question is to post it in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom webinar window, not in the chat. Um, if you're willing to ask the question yourself, it will be much more interesting for all attendees and for our speaker. Please put somewhere in your question, prefer, uh, can ask question myself if you're willing to do so we will temporarily promote you to a panelist on the zoom webinar um, or if you prefer you could write prefer to have my question read so i'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker dr krista langto dr langto has a phd in clinical pharmacology from the university of toronto with additional training in pharmacoepidemiology she's currently a senior scientist in geriatric psychiatry and in the Hurwitz Brain Sciences Program at Sunnybrook Research Institute, and is the research co-director in the Department of Psychiatry at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, and the head of neuro, the neuropsychopharmacology research there. In 2022, she was awarded the Bernick Chair, Bernick Chair in Geriatric Psychopharmacology. She's also a professor of psychiatry and pharmacology toxicology, and Vice Chair of Basic and Clinical Sciences in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Langto is an active researcher with over 350 published papers and editor of the 2021 book, Apathy, Clinical and Neuroscientific Perspectives from Neurology and Psychiatry. Her group's research has focused on optimizing the pharmacotherapy of cognition and neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with dementia and in pre-dementia states. She currently holds grants as a PI from NIH, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, Alzheimer's Association US, Western Brain Institute, and Canadian Institutes of Health Research. She's a full member of the School of Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, a previous winner of the Faculty of Medicine Graduate Education Award, and has successfully supervised more than 35 graduate students. The title of, doc the title of Dr. Langto's talk is Diagnosis and Treatment of Dementia-Related Apathy, Recent Advances. Welcome, Dr. Langto. We're really looking forward to your talk today. Thank you so much for that introduction. And if you give me a moment, I'll start sharing my slides and get into presenter view. All right, ready to go. And I'm going to just get rid of that. So by way of disclosure, I just want to let you know that I've been a consultant for the drug companies listed below. And there are three learning objectives for today. By the end of today's presentation, you will be able to describe the importance and prevalence of apathy in Alzheimer's disease, the current diagnostic criteria for apathy and neurocognitive disorders, and results of a recent pharmacologic intervention that we ran, the ADMET2 trial for apathy in Alzheimer's disease. So 
let's focus in on Alzheimer's disease. As most of you here know, the diagnosis of major neurocognitive disorders is based on the presence of cognitive deficits and their associated, their associated deficits in activities of daily living or function. But today, we're focusing on behavior or neuropsychiatric symptoms. These are a heterogeneous range of psychological reactions, psychiatric symptoms, and behaviors that are thought to result from the presence of dementia. So neuropsychiatric symptoms, even though they're not part of the core diagnostic features, are very common in Alzheimer's disease in this one study where they looked at 50 consecutive outpatients with either mild, moderate, or severe Alzheimer's disease. They found that 88% of the patients reported at least one neuropsychiatric symptom when you looked for them. In a population-based study done out of the Mayo Clinic study of aging, they looked at 329 patients who had dementia and found that 80 to 90% of participants with dementia experienced neuropsychiatric symptoms. So knowing that uh, most people will develop neuropsychiatric symptoms, I have a question for you, and we're gonna launch poll one. Cross-sectionally, what do you think is the approximate prevalence of apathy in Alzheimer's disease? Do you think it's 50%, 60%, 70%, or 80%? And I'll give you about five to 10 seconds to answer that. All right, Simon, how is it looking? Do you want to close the poll and show the results? Hmm, so we have almost an even split, but most people thought that there were about 70% uh, of people who have apathy. And here we go. In uh, Alzheimer's disease dementia that I'm focusing on today, apathy is actually the most common neuropsychiatric symptom. And this shows you results from a meta-analysis of 48 studies in Alzheimer's disease. You can see that apathy was the most common cross-sectionally. It was found in almost half of the participants. It's followed by the other neuropsychiatric symptoms. In about 40% of patients, you expect depression, agitation, aggression, anxiety, sleep disorders, and irritability, followed by appetite disturbances, aberrant motor behaviors, delusions and hallucinations. The psychotic symptoms are less common, followed by disinhibition, and the least common in Alzheimer's disease is euphoria. From the population-based Cache County study, they looked at 408 patients with dementia and found that the five-year prevalence estimate is 71%. And what that tells us is that the majority of patients with Alzheimer's disease dementia would be expected to experience apathy at some point during the course of their illness. We do know that apathy is more frequent with disease progression. So if you look at this graph on your left-hand side, you can see that at CDR stages one, two, and three, which corresponds to mild, moderate, or severe dementia, when you have mild dementia, we expect about 40% of patients to have uh, to display apathy, whereas when you reach the stage of severe cognitive impairment, about 60% of patients would be expected to have apathy. There was also a recent meta-analysis of sex differences in neuropsychiatric symptoms, and they found that while males and females have the same prevalence of apathy, in males, you tend to have a greater severity of apathy. Apathy is associated with negative incomes, negative outcomes in both patients who are inpatients and patients who are outpatients. So in this study by Starkstein et al, they looked at 354 consecutive outpatients with Alzheimer's disease, and they followed up 70% of them one in four years after baseline. And they found that baseline apathy was associated with faster cognitive decline and faster decline in functional abilities. In a study by Dofano et al, they also found that apathy is correlated with caregiver burden. So this study looked at 548 memory clinic outpatients and looked at pre predictors of the Zaret burden inventory or the ZBI. And they found that as expected, severity of cognitive impairment here based on the mini mental status examination score, severity of uh, deficits in your instrumental activities of daily living, and severity of neuropsychiatric symptoms were all strong predictors of caregiver burden. 
But interestingly, they found that out of all the neuropsychiatric symptoms, it was apathy that was the greatest predictor of caregiver burden. Whereas you might've thought agitation or some of the other uh, symptoms would be, it was apathy. Apathy also has an impact when it's found in patients who are living in long-term care facilities. This graph shows you the survival probability in months for patients in somatic care units and in dementia special care units. And you can see the patients without apathy are the black line and the patients with apathy are the dotted line. And you start out with 100% of people surviving and survival decreases over time. And what you can see is that apathy is associated with an increased mortality in nursing home patients, regardless of whether you're in somatic care or a dementia, dementia special care unit. So there's a 77% increase in your mortality rate if you're a nursing home patient who's suffering from apathy. With each one standard deviation uh, increase in the apathy evaluation scale score, you're going to have a 62% increase in mortality rate expected. As shown in this graph of publications on apathy and Alzheimer's disease, there's increasing acknowledgement and interest in apathy as a standalone construct in Alzheimer's disease. With this greater recognition, it's also an emerging focus for pharmacotherapy, and I'll be talking about that today. So before I do, I'm interested in your thoughts. Which of these medications that are approved for uh, treatment of cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease do you think improves apathy in Alzheimer's disease? Do you think it's the cholinesterase inhibitors like denepazil or ribostigmine or galantamine? Do you think it's memantine, the NMDA receptor antagonist? Do you think it's one of the new drugs on the market, aducanumab, all of the above, or none of the above, uh, which isn't one of the choices. So I'll give you a few minutes to see if you think that any of these improve apathy in Alzheimer's disease. Krista, while people are voting, I just want to say it's so awesome that you're using these polls. It makes the Zoom webinar so much more interactive. Thank you. Thank you. And then I know you're all there <laughs> because I see your votes come in. Okay, so Simon, let's see. Yes, let's see what Simon says. Sorry, Simon. Um, okay, so we have uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, 33%. Most people thought uh, memantine, 40%. Aducanumab and um, other people thought all of them had some probability. So let's go over some of the data for that. And it takes me a while to switch back after the poll. There we go. So um, this graph shows results from the cholinesterase inhibitor denepazil in MSAD, the MSAD study, the moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease study. And this shows the MPI, individual item analysis. And as you can see in green, uh, here's the mean change in your NPI score. Improvement is up here and deteriorating or getting worse on your behaviors down here. So for depression, anxiety, and apathy, uh, denepazil did better than placebo for those three uh, NPI behaviors only. If you focus on apathy here, you can see that the mean change Denepazil in blue did better than placebo in gray, but the mean change is just over one point on the NPI apathy scale score. So that is um, not really that clinically significant. You would expect at least two or three points to be clinically significant, but it does show a small difference. For um, memantine that a lot of people voted for, um, and neuropsychiatric symptoms. This graph shows a pooled analysis from six, six studies. And uh, memantine treatment did produce a statistically significant benefit over placebo treatment on the NPI total score. And you can see in bold that it had uh, effects on delusions, agitation, aggression, and irritability, emotional liability. But if you focus on apathy indifference here, you can see that memantine was associated with improvement and placebo with decline, but it wasn't statistically significant. And if you focus also on uh, the scale at the bottom, the improvement in the memantine group, even with the standard deviation, is way lower than one point on the NPI scale. So that would not be at all clinically significant. So we don't think that memantine particularly helps with apathy and difference based on this. 
And um, here's some very recent data from the aducanumab study looking at neuropsychiatric symptoms. As you may be aware, aducanumab is a human immunoglobulin gamma-1 monoclonal antibody directed against the aggregated soluble and insoluble forms of A-beta. It reduces A-beta plaques, which as this group may know is a defining pathophysiological feature of Alzheimer's disease. So it's thought to be an intervention that's actually, instead of being symptomatic, going to uh, interfere with uh, progression in the disease. And here I'm showing you data from the EMERGE trial, which looked at over 1,600 patients who are 50 to 85 years of age with the confirmed presence of amyloid pathology. And they either had mild cognitive impairment, the stage before dementia, or very mild dementia. Overall, aducanumab was associated with reduced neuropsychiatric symptoms. And this graph shows you a decline in NPI item scores with uh, high dose aducanumab in blue and the placebo group in gray. And if we focus on apathy, what happened is that actually ap apathy actually worsened in both groups over time, but it worsened more in the placebo group. So it's not helping uh, improve apathy, but it is helping with the emergence of apathy. And that's what we tend to see with the treatments uh, like colonesterase inhibitors and memantine over time. So this uh, graph shows you a pooled analysis from two randomized placebo-controlled double blind trials. And in these trials, they gave denepazil 10 milligrams per day over 24 weeks. And they assessed the time to emergence of apathy between the denepazil and placebo groups. You can see that pl placebo treatments in black here and denepazil treatment is in gray. 49% of the patients already had apathy at baseline, but in the other 51%, they found that the emergence was greater, the emergence of apathy was greater in the placebo group compared to the denepazil group with an odds ratio of 1.7. So to understand the lack of improvement that we see with the standard treatments for cognition in Alzheimer's disease, I think it's important to explore correlates of apathy. So it's thought that apathy has distinct anatomical correlates across a variety of disorders. And in this review article by Le Heron et al, he reviewed the neuroimaging data in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and stroke, and found that apathy was consistently associated with deficits in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, that's in green in the figure on your right-hand side, and the ventral striatum, that's in fuchsia. Other regions that were sometimes implicated include the insula, the dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex, and the orbital frontal cortex. These interconnected brain regions so not just one area, but looking at a network along with the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and ventral striatum being at its core are thought to play a crucial role in normal motivated behavior. They're associated with willingness to work, willingness to keep working and willingness to learn what's worth working for. So how does this apply specifically to Alzheimer's disease? Well, um, we also think in Alzheimer's disease that uh, apathy has a distinct neuropathology. In this review by Thaleritis et al, his group looked at 11 SPECT and six MRI studies and found that together, they suggest that frontal subcortical networks are involved in apathy in Alzheimer's disease. In particular, they found that the anterior cingulate cortex, so an area associated with initiation and motivational drivers for goal-directed activities, particularly when effort was involved, and they found the orbital frontal cortex, which is associated with interest. It integrates sensory, effective, and motivational information to derive potential reward outcome values. In another review, uh, an analysis done actually by, it was done out of here, out of Columbia by uh, Ed Huey et al. They looked at 57 subjects who had mild Alzheimer's disease and neuropsychiatric symptoms, looking at the ADNI cohort, the Alzheimer's disease Neuro Initi neuroimaging initiative. And they found that together, they suggested medial and orbital frontal, prefrontal cortex networks. And the prefrontal cortex was shown in the previous diagram in blue. Interestingly, they found of the neuropsychiatric symptoms, apathy was the one that had the most robust neuroanatomical associations in AD. And uh, in particular, networks involved in arousal, threat response, and again, in reward processing. So together, these regions of the brain modulate motivation, 
interest, behavioral initiation, and reward mechanisms. Tau, the other um, trademark change in Alzheimer's disease has also been related to apathy in Alzheimer's disease. These uh, figures show you representative PBB3 PET images of Alzheimer's patients with either low apathy in panel A or with high apathy in panel B. As you can see, for the patient with high apathy, there's increased radioligin retention here in the orbital frontal cortex compared to the patient with low apathy. And besides those two individual patients, if you use SPM, statistical parametric mapping, to compare all the brains of the patients, we see greater accumulation of PBB3 tau in the orbital frontal cortex of patients who have high apathy scores compared to low apathy scores. Interestingly, they also did amyloid PET in these patients and found no link between apathy and amyloid PET, which is consistent maybe with the data we saw with aducanumab. So to date, we've seen that current treatments for Alzheimer's disease have a limited impact on apathy, if any. Those treatments target cognition as an outcome and apathy as a secondary outcome, which means that uh, not all of the patients entering the trial had apathy. Furthermore, in all of these studies, there was no diagnosis of apathy, so we don't know whether they had clinically significant apathy or not. We've also seen that apathy may have a distinct pattern of neurodegeneration, such that we may not expect people to respond to cognitive enhancers. So moving forward, we now have updated diagnostic criteria for apathy that I'd like to go over. For apathy and Alzheimer's disease, we have uh, diagnostic criteria that define apathy as a syndrome that have recently been published. These diagnostic criteria for apathy and neurocognitive disorder were done by expert consensus and published in 2021. Um, our group was sponsored by ISCTM, the International Society for CNS Clinical Trials and Methodology, but we also had representation from the American Association of Geriatric Psychiatry, the Neuropsychiatric Symptom Group uh, Professional Interest Area from the Alzheimer's Association US, and the International Psychogeriatric Association. With these members, we had input from academia, from clinicians, and from regulatory stakeholders like the FDA. These diagnostic criteria are particularly applicable in patients with neurocognitive disorder, disorders, whether they have mild, moderate, or severe impairment, because we focused on observable behaviors. They're also compatible with the most recent trans diagnostic criteria that came out published by Philippe Robert et al. in 2019. In those criteria, they keep a social dimension that's separate, but in our criteria, we look at the social activities within each of our dimensions. And I'll show you the diagnostic criteria here. So for a diagnosis of apathy and neurocognitive disorders, the primary diagnosis is any major or mild neurocognitive disorders, so dementia and the pre-dementia states. The characteristic symptoms are diminished initiative, diminished interest, and diminished emotional expression or responsiveness. And it's interesting, we used to say loss of initiative and loss of interest, but working with international groups, when we say loss, they interpret that as complete loss, so having no initiative whatsoever, whereas uh, if we use the word diminished, it means that it can decrease, but it doesn't have to be completely gone. For chronology, the impairment has to be a change from the patient's usual behavior. Duration has to be uh, four weeks of having the symptom present on a regular basis. For severity, uh, the same as you're used to with DSM, maybe it has to cause si clinically significant impairment in your usual functioning, whether it's personal, social, occupational, or any other important areas of functioning. And it has the usual exclusions that it's not exclusively explained by psychiatric illnesses. So I'm going to go into the dimensions a little bit for you. To meet criteria, you have to have diminished goal-directed behaviors as evidenced by having two out of three of either diminished initiative. So that's defined as being less spontaneous and are active than your usual self, less likely to initiate usual activities like hobbies, chores, self-care, or socially conversation or work-related or social activities. Diminished interest, where you'd be less enthusiastic about your usual activities, less interested in or less curious about events in your environment, activities and plans of others, 
reduce participation in activities, even if your caregiver brings you to that activity and sets it up for you, does the initiative part, you're still not interested. Less persistence in maintaining tasks or activities or completing them and being less interested in um, your family and friends. For diminished emotional expression, that's less spontaneous in your emotions. So unlike depression, where you're sad, you express less emotion in response to positive or negative events. You're less affectionate compared to your usual self. And this is one of the reasons why apathy can have a huge caregiver burden. You're less concerned about the impact of your actions on other people and you have less empathy. So having seen all those, um, perhaps some of you have seen patients with apathy. And even if you haven't, I'm interested in your opinion. Which of the following symptoms is the most common in Alzheimer's disease patients with apathy? Do you think you see diminished initiative, more diminished interest, or more diminished emotional expression? And Simon, you can let me know when uh, some of the answers have come in for that. All right, so the majority of people said diminished initiative, followed by diminished interest and diminished emotional expression. So that's the exact order of what we see when we do this on patients. This uh, shows a study from the recent, uh, an analysis from the recent ADMET2 study. And this, we looked at 180 participants with apathy in ADMET2, apathy was defined as scoring at least four on the NPI apathy subscale. In this population, though, the mean was almost eight with a standard deviation of only two, meaning that most people had clinically significant apathy on a scale that goes up to 12. If you just use that cutoff on the NPI apathy score, 94% of patients um, in this case met diagnostic criteria for apathy. And as you can see, and as you all guessed, the most common symptom in 99% of people with apathy is loss of initiative, followed by loss of interest, and then loss of emotion. And this particular study was using the previous criteria with the other wording. The, the second uh, thing that's happened in the literature is that we now have recent clinical trials targeting specifically apathy. And the biggest and most recent of these is the ADMET2 trial. ADMET2 stands for Apathy in Dementia Methylphenidate Trial 2. It was a phase three study of six months that looked at 200 patients who had apathy and mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And in this study, we gave methylphenidate, which you may know as Ritalin or matching placebo. And all patients, as is the standard of care, had a psychosocial intervention for apathy in both groups throughout the six months of the trial. And this was run at nine sites across the US and Canada. And the investigators at those sites are shown in this box on your right-hand side. And it was sponsored by the NIH. And what you may know is that methylphenidate is a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. For dopamine, we know that the link with reward and motivation is well established. And in research that we did, we actually established the link between reward mechanisms and apathy in patients who have Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> For the noradrenergic system, we know it's associated with memory, attention, energy levels, and regulation of emotions. And it's been hypothesized that together, these two neurotransmitters work to influence different components of goal-directed behavior, for example, motivation and energization. So here's what happened in the ADMET2 trial. ADMET2 had two co-primary outcomes. And uh, the first of these was the NPI apathy scale based on our preliminary, preliminary uh, data, the ADMET1 study. So methylphenidate here is shown in blue and placebo is shown in orange. And as you can see at baseline, both groups scored about eight on the NPI apathy score. At six months, both the methylphenidate and the placebo group had a decrease, but the change score was bigger in the methylphenidate group compared to the placebo group. So actually the NPI apathy score improvement was 1.3 points greater in the methylphenidate group versus the placebo group, which was statistically significant. 
The clinical global impression of change scale score shown here is supposed to measure more whether something is clinically significant, even if it's statistically significant. And here you can see that the odds of improvement in CGIC was 1.9, which was only trending for significance at a p-value of 0.07. But if you look at it in an adjusted longitudinal model, it does squeak into being significant. And here's what it looks like plotted out. In the methylphenidate group here, 44% of patients improved compared to the placebo group, where 35% of patients improved. And for worsening, 9% of methylphenidate patients worsened over six months compared to 21% in the placebo group. And remember when you're looking at this that everyone was continuously getting that psychosocial intervention for uh, apathy. So this is the drug effect on top of the psychosocial intervention. We also looked at apathy remission to find here a scoring completely zero on the apathy subscale to see how many people remitted. At the top here on the survival curve, 100% of people have apathy. And if the curve reached the bottom here at zero, it would mean that no people in the group had apathy anymore. As you can see from the curve, for the first 100 days, the methylphenidate group had twice the increase in remitted people compared with the placebo group, so a hazard ratio of 2.2. Over the six months, though, the groups become more similar, so the lines become parallel, and the hazard ratio decreases to 1.6, so you see the, um, the impact of the psychosocial intervention catching up. I'd like to also talk about selectivity for apathy compared to all the other neuropsychiatric symptoms in ADMET2, and this is a spider web plot. So at the end of this, at the outside of the spider web, you have the higher scores, and at the inside of the spider web, you have a score of zero. So there's more behavioral disturbances on the outside and no behavioral disturbances on the inside. And this shows the three visits baseline in blue, and then the uh, month three visit in green, and uh, in this orangey red, you have your F6 visit. So as you can see, for all of the other neuropsychiatric symptoms, this is the plot of the methylphenidate group. For the most part, other neuropsychiatric symptoms got better over time. We have one little blip here in the uh, appetite disturbance, which is consistent with what we know about methylphenidate, that when you're taking an amphetamine, you can have a decrease in appetite. But then by the uh, month six, it's improved again. So over time, uh, giving methylphenidate, we didn't get worse delusions and hallucinations that you might expect. We didn't get more aberrant motor behaviors and we didn't get more agitation. When you compare then methylphenidate to placebo, there was no difference in other neuropsychiatric symptoms, except there was an increase in uh, the NPI subscale for aberrant motor behavior in the methylphenidate group compared to the placebo group, which is consistent with the activating effects that we expect with uh, something that's an amphetamine. There were no differences in this trial in caregiver distress between drug and placebo, cognitive measures, or quality of life. For tolerability, 90% um, of people completed methylphenidate group and 91% of them completed placebo group, which is very comparable. There were no deaths in either group. And for serious adverse events, we had uh, we found them in 17% of the methylphenidate group and 12% of the placebo group. But for the SAE in the methylphenidate group, they were unrelated, considered unrelated uh, to the medication. So you've seen the results for methylphenidate. Let's ask, uh, let's launch poll four. Of the off label possibilities for clinically significant apathy in Alzheimer's disease, I want to know what you would first try. And uh, let's assume here, we always give the psychosocial intervention or the non-pharmacologic interventions first. So we're assuming that this person's already not responded to non-pharmacologic interventions or um, they've already been tried and they may have had a partial response, but now you want to add on a medication. So the medications are bupropion, modafinil, methylphenidate, the antidepressant citalopram, or none of the above. All right, so it looks like I've uh, 
that some people are convinced that methylphenidate is probably the best bet. We have some for bupropions, uh, fewer for modafinil, some for citalopram, and 5% uh, of people who wouldn't give any of those. So let's look at some of those data. Okay, so if you picked bupropion, uh, there was a recent trial of unsuccessful treatment of apathy with bupropion in Alzheimer's disease. This was a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial uh, that looked at people with apathy who had dementia of the Alzheimer's type. They were supposed to uh, recruit uh, 216 patients, but they stopped after 50% recruitment because of futility. They gave bupropion for 12 weeks. They gave 150 milligrams for the first month and then 300 milligrams thereafter for the remaining two months. And bupropion is actually similar to methylphenidate in that it, it, it inhibits norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake but it also antagonizes nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So you know that uh, the cholinesterase inhibitors are actually trying to increase the amount of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, but this would antagonize the nicotinic receptors. So it has a slightly different mechanism of action. This graph on the left-hand side shows the apathy evaluation scale over the 12 weeks of the trial. Um, higher is more apathy on this scale, and you can see bupropion in gray and placebo in orange. There was absolutely no significant effect of bupropion compared to placebo. In fact, there was a trend of worsening by two points in the bupropion group over time. The proportions of adverse events were similar across the groups, 72% uh, in the bupropion group and 61% in the placebo group. But what was concerning in this study is that we're, there were statistically significant negative effects of bupropion. In fact, it, on the apathy evaluation scale, it showed um, that uh, placebo was preferred to bupropion for the emotional subscale. The same with the NPI total score. It was worse in the people on bupropion for NPI caregiver distress. That was also worse. Depression was worse in the bupropion group as measured by the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale or MADRAS and quality of life uh, measured by the quality of life in Alzheimer's disease scale was worse in this particular study that came out in 2020 by Mayer et al. For modafinil, there is uh, less data, but there has been a trial that came out with the unsuccessful treatment of apathy with modafinil. And just by comparison for methylphenidate, we also started with a study of uh, 23 patients. So it's a small study, but there's still no signal. So this is 23 patients with mild to moderate probable Alzheimer's disease. They were randomized to placebo or modafinil at 200 milligrams daily. Over time, both groups had a significant decrease in apathy. Um, there was no significant group by time interaction over eight weeks. So this shows you at baseline, modafinil in blue and placebo in orange. They have similar scores for apathy on the frontal systems behavioral scale. And over time, they both decrease a little bit, um, but there's no difference between the groups. For modafinil, the mechanism of action is distinct from amphetamines. It's thought to inhibit dopamine and noradrenergic uh, transporters, the same as uh, methylphenidate, but it also increases, in addition to dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and histamine release. So it does have a slightly different mechanism of action. For serotonin reuptake inhibitors like citalopram, Apathy has been theorized to be actually an adverse of, uh, effect of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, though there are no strong studies that firmly establish this. For indirect evidence, we have the CTAD study. Uh, the CTAD study was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. It wasn't targeting apathy. It was targeting Alzheimer's disease patients with agitation, and they looked at, over, at 186 patients. In that trial, they were treated with a psychosocial intervention, plus randomized to either citalopram or placebo. And they found that 61% of patients had apathy or indifference at baseline. The odds ratio for apathy improvement 
wasn't statistically significant. So it wasn't making apathy worse or making apathy better in the 61% of patients who had it. Although the direction of the odds ratio would be slightly in favor of making apathy worse. So certainly no um, indication that it's making apathy better. There have also been some case control studies and here's uh, one of the larger ones. In this study, they looked at uh, depressed elderly, 384 of them, and they found that SSRI use was associated with apathy. In the SSRI group uh, users, more patients had apathy than in the non-SSRI group, and the adjusted odds ratio was almost two. So we don't think that SSRIs particularly help with apathy. So how do we move forward? Well, if you didn't say, uh, you know, methylphenidate group, I agree with you that 56% of Alzheimer's disease patients showed no benefit from methylphenidate group in the ADMET2 trial, even though uh, ADMET2, ADMET2 was significant, uh, it had an effect size that was modest to medium uh, based on effect size conventions. So, we asked ourselves, you know, variability in treatment response could be related to clinical factors, and we wanted to analyze this. And this is, these are some data that were recently presented at the AAGP, and we hope are coming soon to be published. So in this, we looked at 22 potential clinical predictors of treatment outcome that we chose a priori. So we looked, for example, in four categories. We looked at demographics, like age, sex, and education level. We looked at markers of disease state, for example, the severity of cognitive impairment, the severity of your functional deficits, and the severity of your apathy at baseline. We looked at concomitant medications, for example, cholinesterase inhibitors, and I showed you the data on that. We looked at memantine, and I showed you the data on that. And we looked at uh, concomitant serotonin reuptake inhibitors because patients could be stabilized on any of these medications before they came into the trial, as well as the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, but it turns out we didn't have enough people on SNRIs to uh, consider it further. We also looked at the profile of neuropsychiatric symptoms. What other neuropsychiatric symptoms did they have besides apathy that could either predict that they would worsen with methylphenidate or predict that they might get better? So how did we do this? We have 22 predictors, but first let me ask you, knowing what you know about apathy now and ADMET and methylphenidate group, in ADMET 2, which neuropsychiatric symptoms do you think might have been associated with a smaller chance of response, so less response to methylphenidate compared to placebo in MET2. Do you think it was having more severe apathy? Do you think it was a presence of anxiety, aberrant motor behaviors, depression, or none of the above? All right, survey says more severe apathy, which is a good guess. Anxiety, because we know that methylphenidate could increase anxiety. Aberrant motor behavior, because we saw that that was the one difference between methylphenidate and placebo. Having depression um, at baseline, even though we weren't taking people who were actively depressed, maybe that interferes or none of the above. And the most common one was anxiety. So, Let's see what happened. So I'll show you, talk you through how we're analyzing this. So first of all, um, for each of the 22 predictors, we want to look at change in the neuropsychiatric inventory apathy scale score between methylphenidate compared to placebo. And I know you can't see this slide very well, but what I want to put it here to illustrate was, if I can get my laser pointer on, for example, on this side of the line, placebo was better. And on this side of the line, the methylphenidate group was better. Because remember, we have people randomized to methylphenidate or placebo. So for example, for education, where we broke education into four different levels, high school or less, compared to in the top group, um, being a professional or having gone to graduate school. You can see that for the four groups of education, they're all on the methylphenidate side 
So it didn't matter what your education level was. But for cholinesterase inhibitors shown here, if the answer to cholinesterase inhibitors was no, the majority of people responded to placebo. But if the answer to cholinesterase inhibitors being taken concomitantly was yes, then there was more of a probability that you would respond to methylphenidate groups. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for predictors that distinguish between responding to methylphenidate compared to responding to placebo, the psychosocial intervention, to think for the future, how might you pick people who might respond? So looking at this whole graph, there were six predictors with larger differences in effect. And here we look for at least two points on the neuropsychiatric inventory apathy subscale, which is the major outcome variable of this trial. And we found that methylphenidate was more efficacious than placebo if you had no anxiety. So whoever, all of you who answered anxiety, you were right. Also for participants who had no agitation at baseline, for participants who were previously stabilized on cholinesterase inhibitors, you had a better chance of responding. For our younger age group, the patients were between 52 and 72 years of age. For patients with normal diastolic blood pressure, we know that uh, this was supposed to be a marker, if we could, of the neurodynergic effects of methylphenidate. We know that central and peripheral neurodynergic tone are enhanced in patients who have uh, hypertension. And this has been shown in young patients with uncomplicated hypertension and measured. So we looked at that as a marker of the neurodynergic tone. And it was also more successful in patients with more functional impairment on the Alzheimer's disease cooperative study activities of daily living scale. So those are the six predictors. But the next question is, when we use those six predictors together, how well do they predict who's going to respond? So for each patient, using those six predictors, you can calculate an index score. So saying that patient is on a cholinesterase inhibitor and doesn't have anxiety and maybe does have agitation. So you can use those six predictors and for each patient calculate an index score based on the model's predicted response. And then we wanted to see how well those index scores actually predict response. To do that, we took our participants and we divided them into 10 subgroups, so deciles based on their index score. And these are your deciles from one to 10 for those patients. And we looked at once you have that index score, what was your actual change in the trial? Uh, did you do better on the NPI apathy score or did you do worse? So this shows when people worsen on the NPI apathy scale score, and this shows when people improve. So for example, two groups, deciles one and two, in the first two groups, it favors methylphenidate response, whereas in decile 10, you can see that uh, this whole group is on the non-response side of the line. So it does have some difference. And if you just divide people by their median index score, which was negative 1.33, people in the higher above the median, uh, almost 80% of participants responded. So here are people above this median score. These are all the people responding. So you can see that 80% respond. And if you're below the median, so these five groups, 49% of those with a lower index score responded. So fewer people responded with a lower index score. The other thing we're looking at is we know that variability in treatment response may have a biologic basis. And um, there's a big push for personalized medicine. Personalized inter interventions based on biomarkers or genetics are thought to be key in neuropsychiatric drug development. So we wanted to determine biomarkers that would help distinguish responders from non-responders. And this was also presented last week at AAGP by my uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Timati. So in ADMET2, we did have a pilot study in the last almost 50, 50 participants of blood-based biomarkers. We looked at uh, neuronal loss. So for that, we looked at neurofilament light and S100B. And I showed you in earlier research that we know that apathy becomes more frequent as uh, the disease progresses. So we wanted a blood-based biomarker of neuronal loss to maybe ask the question, if you're uh, too far advanced, does that mean you won't respond or does it mean that you have a better chance of response or does it not matter? We looked at inflammatory markers. So interleukin IL-6 and TNF-alpha uh, 
tumor necrosis factor alpha. Those are both pro-inflammatory cytokines compared to IL-10, which is negative immunoregulatory. So we looked at uh, uh, three different cytokines here. And uh, it has been seen in apathy in Alzheimer's disease that you have more uh, TNF alpha receptors. So we wanted to see what would happen with inflammation. And the third group that we looked at were markers of oxidative stress, um, particularly lipid peroxidation, as measured by early stage markers, LPH, lipid hydroperoxide, and two late stage markers, 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, and 8-ISO, 8-isoprostane. We also looked at the 8-ISO to LPH ratio because in an earlier study done by, by my graduate student, Kritlin Bala, we found that that ratio not in people with Alzheimer's disease, but in people with mild vascular cognitive impairment, um, more oxidative stress was associated with both apathy and with executive dysfunction. So we wanted to see if we would find the same thing in the ADMET2 trial and whether it would actually predict response. So when you have all these different uh, biomarkers that are, although they're all measured in blood, they all have a different scale. So First, you can see here that we took all our biomarkers and we used Pareto scaling to normalize the biomarkers. It reduces the relevant importance of sometimes you have these really big values and it puts them all on a common scale. When you do that, when you normalize your biomarkers, you can just put them in a regular multivariate statistical analysis once they're scaled on the same thing. So this shows you multivariate regression with all the baseline biomarkers as independent predictors together and baseline apathy as a covariate. And remember, this is a pilot study in 49 patients. But what we found is that out of all of the blood-based biomarkers we looked at, higher TNF-alpha was fairly strongly associated with less change, so not doing as well on the NPI apathy score at F6, the final visit of the trial. And here are the results for TNF-alpha. You can see that of the markers for uh, neuronal loss, maybe S100B is trending if you looked at a larger number of patients. And for oxidative stress, as we found before, potentially 8-ISO could be associated. For higher TNF-alpha, it also had a consistent relationship it was associated with less likelihood of response on clinical global impression of change, that other major outcome in the ADMET2 trial. So less likelihood of CGI apathy improvement with TNF-alpha, 24 patients improved out of this particular subgroup. It was also associated with a greater severity of apathy at the final visit. So it looks like if uh, what this, these data tell us is that inflammation at baseline indicated here by TNF-alpha was associated with worsening of apathy over time. But again, these are preliminary analyses and preliminary data. So in summary, in AD, apathy is common. It has a negative impact and it doesn't improve significantly with current Alzheimer's disease pharmacotherapies. We think that apathy may have a distinct neurobiological profile. Um, moving forward, diagnostic criteria have recently been proposed that define clinically significant apathy. ADMET2 trial shows us that apathy can be a drug responsive behavior. For future research, we need to work on validating our diagnostic criteria. And we're also looking at neuroimaging and blood-based biomarkers for personalized medicine and to monitor treatment response, as well as potentially define subtypes of apathy. And as the field is, uh, as the whole field is moving more towards mild cognitive impairment in the pre-dementia states, it will become important to identify apathy in the prodromal states like mild cognitive impairment and mild behavioral impairment. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me, as well as thanking my lab, my collaborators, and the persons with dementia and care partners who participate in my trials, as well as our funders, particularly for uh, ADMET2, the NIH. So thank you very much.